Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Orange Weekly presented by Krause Health. My name is Brent X, Syracuse.com. A little football game going on in Death Valley, South Carolina this weekend. Perhaps you've heard, and you thought last week was big. Oh, no, 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 no. The stakes have gone higher. Syracuse Clemson, number five Tigers, number 14 Orange in this matchup. Syracuse number 14 in both polls this week after a, a tense game. I'll, I'll describe it that way over NC State. You know, Syracuse won 24 to 9, but, you know, that thing was still a game in the fourth quarter and left a lot of points on the board in the second quarter. But ultimately, uh, Syracuse wins before uh, one of the biggest home crowds uh, in recent memory. There was a sellout against Clemson uh, three years ago, if you'll remember, in 2019, but 49,000 plus walked away happy uh, uh, customers after Syracuse beat NC State last week, and it just sets up a heavyweight bout here between the Orange and the Tigers. First place in the Atlantic Division, control of the Atlantic Division. Wake Forest is right there, too. You can't count them out, but they have a loss on the board to Clemson, so Syracuse could really uh, not only continue to make history here, uh, first time since 1987. That's been a common thread and a common theme, as uh, we'll discuss here shortly, a column I wrote this week about that. But, man, it just doesn't get bigger than this, and it's just fun that here you have uh, Syracuse this late in the season, still undefeated. This game is always big between Syracuse and Clemson. If anything, Syracuse has really been uh, a, a thorn in the paw, if you will, of the Tigers, beating them in 2017, nearly beating them in Death Valley in 2018. Last year was a three-point game between these two as well. So what do we set up today? So you are welcome to jump in here in the comments, as always, here on Orange Weekly, as Eric jumps in. Hello, Eric. Going great. Going great. Big weekend coming up here. Pretty excited about it. Hope you guys are as well. So your questions, your comments on Syracuse football. We're going to focus on Syracuse football today. Sometimes we dip in a little hoops or some other things going on, but uh, we're going to hone in on this matchup and some Syracuse football matters in the episode today. If you're watching live on Syracuse Orange uh, football on our Facebook page on Syracuse Orange Sports on YouTube, get the opportunity to drop in, get some comments, get some things uh, going on on this matchup. But if you do miss the show live, we stream Thursdays right around noon Eastern time. But if you do miss the show live, some of you are watching on the YouTube clip later uh, down the road here. We post that on Syracuse.com and our uh, social media channels. So easy to catch up on the show if you do miss it live. We got Cody in the house. We got Blake in the house. Thank you, Blake. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Been uh, we've been working hard this week and uh, glad that you're enjoying uh, the content we got out there so far. And Blake wants to know, do you think any Syracuse players will have their coming out party this Saturday? You can't have a better coming out party opportunity than ABC noon game, number five team in the country. You know, for those that know about Garrett Schrader, maybe he has his real breakout. For those that don't know about Sean Tucker, hard not to at this point. And Tucker, you know, has been a little off his game this year. It seems like he's bouncing back at a couple of huge runs last week against NC State. That could be his coming out party. Garrett Williams, Deuce Chestnut, Mikel Jones, Andre Schmidt, NFL-level players, maybe somebody who's a little off the radar screen, steps up and has a big-time game in this one. Big opportunities there, Eric. And I'll tell you, Allison, uh, always great to see you. Says, what's your prediction? Sold-out game in Death Valley. I think we're evenly matched. So I hope you got a chance to read our predictions on Syracuse.com today. As the old expression goes, two out of three ain't bad. Myself and Emily Liker picked Syracuse to win. Nate Mank did not. So we'll see who's uh, right on this one. Now, Emily and I have two very different ideas of how this game is going to go. She feels this will be more of a grinder, low-scoring type of football game. I think it's going to be the opposite, guys. I have Syracuse winning 44-41. to 41. That sounds like a lot of points, but I want you to come with me for a second here. What we're going to do is we're going to go down the Clemson schedule, okay? Georgia Tech 41-10. I don't even want to mention the Furman game. Who cares? Louisiana Tech, 48-20. Wake Forest, 51-45. Now, that's a game that went to double overtime, but high score there. NC State, 30-20. Boston College, 31-3. Florida State, 34-28. Those are the scores of Clemson's games this year. And this is a team that's noted for having a tough physical defense, and they do. They're passing uh, uh, defense, 95th in the country right now, which I think is notable. And you have a top 10 defense out of Syracuse, right? So a lot of those elements would seem to equal a low-scoring game. But Clemson just has this 
knack to lure teams into a shootout. And I think their defense, if you can get past that front four, and that's a t- as tough a front four as it gets in college football, you know, that's a big if right there, but I think it can be done. I think Syracuse is going to pull out all the stops. You know, the old expression about, uh, uh, you know, everything but the kitchen sink, right? Throw everything you have at them. I think Robert and I still got a few tricks up his sleeve. I think Syracuse Allison, as you noted, matches up with this team. Emily Liker did a great job doing a statistical analysis of that on Syracuse.com this week uh, on how even these two teams are statistically. I think DJ Uwe Ungagale, and I can't believe I've learned how to say that, by the way. It took me about 14,000 times, but we got there. DJ and Garrett Schrader are even statistically. Now, there's a lot of big ifs here, and let's go over the big ifs. The Syracuse offensive line, which, by the way, was nom- nominated. I had a Boston accent there for a second. Nominated, little Coach Mac there for you. God love you. Was nominated for the Joe Moore Award this week. That goes to the best offensive line in college football. And speaking of Nate Mink, who tweeted this week, because Nate knows about this stuff, uh, the people that evaluate that award know what they're doing. You know, not a bunch of hack sports writers like us, right? Like the people that watch this stuff know. That does not change the fact, though, that the Syracuse offensive line has got to knock off the penalties. You got to knock off procedures, holding, offsides. It happens a few times a game. You got to build that in. But the margin for error is that, if not that, if not that, against Clemson and that defensive line. So that's number one. Um, your star's got to shine. Schrader's got to shine. Sean Tucker's got to shine. I don't know if you guys heard my cat on the other side of the door over there. He's saying hello, everybody. Um, Gatson. Now, Cody brings up an interesting point. I feel like this is a game where a different receiver steps up. Maybe Alford has a big game. Cody, I think the clock's ticking on that. And what was interesting is Dabo Swinney this week, by name, said three names at his press conference. Garrett Schrader, Sean Tucker, Aronde Gatson. Okay, the secret's out on Gatson. The guy pops on film. How could he not? You know, 6'5 dude out there catching footballs. He gets open all the time. Much like when you're watching uh, Travis Kelsey, much like when you're watching Cooper Cup, like think of guys in the NFL that just always get open. That's been Gatson because Robert and I is just finding ways, pre-snap motion, different formations, cut blocks. He's just getting open. Someone's going to stop that. And if you can nominate somebody to do it, wouldn't Clemson be – at the top of your list. Frankly, I thought NC State would do it last week, and the dude had like 140 yards in that game. So, Cody, I think you're spot on that some more some creativity has got to be filtered in the offense here and some different receivers have to step up. I'm wondering about the defense and Garrett Williams. I think he's going to play. We didn't get a chance to talk to him this week. Typically, players that are on the borderline in terms of injury don't talk to the media. From everything I heard, he's good to go, and I think he's going to be out there. Will he be 100%? That's the question as Blake uh, jumps in with that question as we're talking about it. I can tell you Deuce Chestnut is very healthy, and we're going to talk more about Deuce here in a second. I talked to Deuce. He's fine. I, I think he just – I don't know what happened in the fourth quarter there. We didn't go over specifics of the injury. He was dancing on a video that Syracuse football put out, the celebration in the NC State uh, locker room after that game. So Deuce is fine. Garrett Williams, uh, I would put in the – I would imagine Dino Baber. Now, Dino Baber said earlier this week that he is, as he put it, he used a baseball phrase. He's going to take the pitch on injury questions from now on. So maybe he won't even discuss it on his radio program tonight. We shall see about that. But I think Garrett Williams is going to be out there now. Okay. On Deuce Chestnut. I wrote a column about this today. I hope you guys can check out the q and I had with Deuce. This is a confident football player. Now, in the offseason, some of you may have seen this, but in case you didn't, Deuce Chestnut changes his number to zero. And the reason he changes his number to zero is that's how many catches he wants the opposing receiver he's going up against to have. And he wants it to be, as he put it, cold on that island I'm going to put him on, right? You could buy in this era of name, image, and likeness. You can buy sub-zero t-shirts with with deuce chestnut when i talked to deuce this week every time i brought up clemson he just wasn't having it no we're a good team too dj ui Unga, i asked him about dj ui Ungale, and he said well you know we have a top five defense in my opinion we'll see how he does against us right like the we didn't talk long but when deuce talks 
He speaks with purpose. He speaks with confidence. He doesn't say much. He's not shy in the sense that maybe a Sean Tucker is, or Andre Gatson's been a pretty shy kid, uh, getting more media exposure lately. But he almost talks like Drago in Rocky Ford. I must break you. Like the way that he just speaks with the confidence of a player that, you know, Randy Moss isn't going to get a catch on me today. I really like that. And I think that's the attitude you have to have to beat Clemson. I like that he said that. I And I asked him about the uh, – so Cle- Clemson wins. They're going to set an ACC record for consecutive home wins, which is interesting because when Syracuse went to Florida State last year in basketball now, it was the same thing. Florida State was one win away from setting the ACC record for consecutive home wins. Syracuse snapped that. And now the football team's got a chance to do the same thing in this game. If you're going to go do that, and when I asked him about the record, he said, yeah, I feel bad for him because we're going we're gonna to snap that. I mean, just without blinking. And I was the only one that talked to him. So this isn't like a group media session. It's not like he was trying to get some message out there. But you got to have that ice in your veins, literally, in his sense, right, to go be Clemson, to be in that game. Their receivers are good. I wouldn't put them in the great category. I think they've been certainly overperforming this year based on expectation. But, yeah, look, they're Clemson. They're Clemson players. They're all four or five-star guys. You know, Antonio Williams, 334 yards, couple of touchdowns. Boo Collins is somebody you got to keep a close eye on. He's got five touchdowns this year, uh, 18 catches, 290 yards so far. He averages 16 yards a play. And you go down the line, look, they've got players. But the, the player I'm most concerned about from a Syracuse standpoint is Will Shipley. Will Shipley has always been good. He's been building up. He's somebody that pops on the screen when you watch Clemson play. He had the game of his life against Florida State last week. I think he's going to be a problem out of the backfield. Syracuse hasn't really seen a player like that this year on an opposing team. That's going to be an adjustment. How healthy are the linebackers? Pretty much everybody that left the field last week. Mikel Jones is good. Deuce Chestnut's good. I think Garrett Williams is good. Um, Leon Lowry, we didn't get an update on him. We'll see about that. There's always a surprise or two and guys that don't warm up. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that on Saturday. So depending on the health of the defense, certainly, but man, don't, you could have the 85 bears over there and Will Shipley is a player who's just going to give you trouble. That's why I think this is going to be a high scoring game. I just don't think this is a game. Either team stops the other. It's just who has the ball in the fourth quarter when it matters. And I think we're going to see a great football game. I think we're going to see a great football game. By the way, like the the motivation that's there. So if you're Syracuse, you're going to Death Valley, sold out crowd. You're going to obviously the biggest stage you can be on in terms of a team you're playing, ABC, noon game, right after game day, right? Sean McDonough and company calling the game. They scheduled Syracuse for homecoming, right? If I'm Dino Babers, I'm eating up every source of motivation that I can just keep funneling at these guys. You're 13 point underdogs. Now, why is Syracuse a 13 point underdog? Because Vegas wants your money. <laughs> That's why. If they set that line at seven, eight, nine, the money's not going to go where they want it to. So, 13, you get the angry, emotional response from Syracuse fans like, how dare you? I'll show you. And here's my money, right? So, don't pay attention to that. But, but if you're Dino Babers, Oh, I, I, I'm every I'm saying that number more than I can fathom it. Every time I walk by my players, 13, 13, they think you're 13 points worse than this team, right? I mentioned the um, homecoming thing, like everything that you can build in for internal motivation. I mean, it's a big enough game as it is, but that just gives you that extra edge and that extra push. That's going to be big. A couple more from you guys. Greg says a win would be great in so many ways. I won't be too upset if it doesn't happen as long as the team's in the game. When put in perspective with the previous season and what the prognosticators were projecting. So, fan, I'm very happy with where the team stands. Wins from here on out exceed my expectation, especially when more wins are likely. Yeah. So, we're in the middle point of the season. Emily, Nate, and I put out our midseason grades, predictions, bowl predictions. That's up on Syracuse.com here today on Thursday as we speak. So, please check that out. Clemson, Notre Dame at the Dome. And now you're going on the road a lot more. So you're on the road for the first time since September. What was that? 10th against UConn home against Notre Dame. And then you're pretty much on the road the rest of the way. Florida state's at home too. So you got two big home games left, Notre Dame, Florida state, but you're at wake forest. You are at 
uh, Boston College it's at the end of the road here. Let, let me just pull it up while we're talking about it here. We'll just go over the schedule uh, as it stands here. It's just give me a sec to, to pull that up, guys. But bottom line is there's not one game on the second half of the schedule that makes me say no way, no how. This team has proven they can hang with anybody. They can beat anybody if they play their best game and check all the boxes they need to check. So Clemson, Notre Dame at home at Pitt. That's never easy, and Pitt has just completely owned that series in recent years, uh, to be honest. Home to Florida State, at Wake, at BC. That's what you got left. Six games left here. Halfway home, 6-0, and bowl eligible already. First time since 1987 that this team uh, is undefeated. There's my man Bob. What's going on there, Bob? Good to see you, my friend. Uh, Bob wrote a great piece for us on Syracuse.com. That's our friend Bob from the Onondaga Historical Association, friends, that compared this team to 1987 uh, earlier this season. I followed up on that a little bit, Bob, by talking to some players from the team from 1987. And look, what you've heard all, all over and over again the last few weeks is the expression and the term first time since 1987. So I figured this was the week to do it because this is the first time Syracuse has been 6-0 since 1987. And if they keep winning, you're just going to keep hearing that. First time since 87. There's a lot of similarities between this team and that team. And I know it was 35 years ago, but that team. Uh, so let's go through it here. In 1986, Syracuse football went 5-6. and six, And they made a commitment to a lot of players to really hone down and be better the next year. They started 0-4 that year. They're wearing these 0-4 lapel pins that Dick McPherson gave them, the coach at the time. They made the no alcohol pledge and just went through some of the toughest spring practices, toughest training camp that had ever been through. And they knew they had something good. Much like this year, that year, this year, Garrett Schrader steps up after, you know, a decent year last year, but just kind of getting, you know, his bearings. Donnie McPherson had a Okay year in 1986, he had a Heisman Trophy year in 1987. And don't get me going on that. That dude should have won the Heisman. Tim Brown, get out of here with that, okay? So you have that. I understand football teams say it all the time, one game at a time, right? But it's a common thread with winning football teams. In 1987, the expression was one down, one to go. It's actually was started by Jake Krauthammel, Syracuse's old athletic director. This team says, let's go 1-0 and this week, right? There's a lot of similarities between those two teams. There's a lot of formulas about what makes a team good and has the potential. I don't think they're going to go undefeated, but they're in the conversation and they just keep winning games. And as we went over with the schedule there, there's nobody on that schedule that makes me say no way, no how. I think they're going to lose a couple games down the stretch because that's just football and there's just days things don't go your way and you just so many unpredictable factors that are coming down the road. But if we're going to continue to say first time since 1987, I went and I looked at it. I'm like, yeah, I get it now. And it's not just, you know, a stat reference. It's not just a record reference. It's like there's a lot of similarities between these two. I don't want to give away all of it. So you guys go read that piece and check it out. But always fun to catch up with. Uh, boy, that team had some characters, man. Uh, Jeff Mangrum, man, I don't know how you talk to Jeff Mangrum and not want to go run through a wall after that. Blake Bednar's great offensive lineman. Talked to Paul Fraze. Paul Fraze, by the way, who now lives in Florida, he was a captain on that 1987 team going to Death Valley with former Syracuse quarterback Todd Philcox. Todd Philcox was on that team. He was the holder that year and then eventually took over for Donnie McPherson after McPherson graduated. And great quarterback. Todd Philcox played nine years in the National Football League. So it was cool to catch up with those guys. I think you'll enjoy that piece a little bit. So, look, bottom line is the stars have to shine. The offensive line has got to cut it back with the penalties. And then there's all the weird stuff. How do you handle the crowd? Turnovers, right? Syracuse has the most turnovers in the ACC. This defense is top 10, right? I feel like the, as we were talking about the confidence factor here, like, look, Clemson's good. Clemson's always good. Clemson recruits five-star guys. They're just in that short breath of the teams that are always going to be in the conversation for the college football playoff and, and all due respect to them. But this is the best Syracuse team that's played Clemson since these two joined the ACC, bar none. I know the 2017 team beat Clemson. And Clemson was number two in the country then. This team's better. That 2017, 2017 team didn't win a game the rest of the season. They put everything they had into beating that Clemson team. 
And it was great because it was a, a high watermark for Syracuse football under Dino Babers kind of making this, uh, you know, this uh, the, the upward trajectory that they've made, right? And we're making at the time, but not as good as this team. 2018 team, all due respect to them, went 10 and three. They were, you know, a fourth quarter play away from beating that team. In both those circumstances, you have to remember Clemson had their backup quarterback in. 2017, Kelly Bryant goes down. 2018, Trevor Lawrence goes down. And was it Chase Bryce who was in off the top of my head in the fourth quarter of that game? But that's football. You, you just get breaks like that. And you can't just, you know, like, oh, sorry, you guys lost your starting quarterback. I think we'll go home now. Look at NC State last week. And Jack Chambers had a pretty decent game for NC State. He had that team in a position to tie the game. NC State wanted an 18-play drive in the fourth quarter of that game. Syracuse's red zone defense was better. They only scored nine points in that game. So it's just a combination of confidence, which they have. Do you match up with this team? Yes. Do you uh, win some of those matchups? Yes. The one thing you got to worry about is the environment, right? Because when even the players that went to Death Valley a couple of years ago, remember it was COVID year, not a sold out on top of you type of stadium like it is. Death Valley can be one of the most intimidating atmospheres in college football, much like the atmosphere NC State was walking into last week. And, you know, we talked to a few players about that this week. Weirdly, the crowd at the Dome last week is going to get this team ready for this game. Right now, it's the opposite, of course. That's more on the... So, you know, when you're at home, obviously, you're on top of the offense. Now you're on top of the defense. So how that transition, you know, can Garrett Schrader, Sean Tucker and company handle that? I mentioned the procedure calls with the offensive line. These guys are getting procedure calls at home when you don't have 80,000 people on top of you. So that's just going to be a huge factor and an important factor in this game. No doubt about it. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, plug, if you will, with you guys before uh, we uh, depart uh, stage left for the day. Um, look for a video tomorrow that I'm going to put out here uh, with Scott Hansen. Scott Hansen, as many of you know, if you're fans of the NFL Red Zone, is the host of the NFL Red Zone. There's two Syracuse hosts. So there's Scott Hansen does like um, basically like cable, YouTube TV, cable, if you get the Red Zone that way. Andrew Siciliano, also a Syracuse alum, does direct TV. So depending on who your Red Zone host is. And the NFL red zone is one of the greatest inventions in the history of sports. I mean, that's just one of the greatest television concepts ever, right? Scott Hansen went to Syracuse. Scott Hansen was a walk-on for Syracuse football. He played first for Dick McPherson, then for Paul Pascaloni. He was at Syracuse from 1989 to 1992. And he's got a great story. He's got a great story about his time at Syracuse, pursuing broadcasting, certainly has some football stories to tell. I don't want to give it away, but he's uh He's got a Rudy-like story in an award he was given for being a walk-on at Syracuse football, and I think you'll enjoy that. We just had a ball. So I'm going to be honest with you here. I was originally going to do this as just a Q&A for Syracuse.com, like, you know, written Q&A. But I experimented a little bit. So you're watching us here, and you can kind of see that graphic that's around here. And, you know, when we do shows like Orange Weekly, when we do our post-game show on these same channels, you know, uh, we like to make a little bit of a production out of it. We, you put your comments in it and you got the frame around the screen and you want it to look nice, right? we got the nice background here. When I was talking to, to Scott, I just did it in my, in my dining room and didn't have the greatest set in the world behind me. And a lot of people were doing that these days. He did it in his kitchen. But what was cool about it was he kind of turned the camera and he showed me his setup that he watches TV on, not the red zone set, but just what he watches football on on Saturday, seven screen setup, always has Syracuse on there. He showed me the prop that he won as a walk-on again. I want you guys to watch and, and see what it is. And it just turned into something more than just, hey, here's a QA. and a So you're going to see that video tomorrow. And we had a lot of fun. He told some great stories. I did my Coach Mack impression for him. I did my Coach Pascaloni impression for him. Um, we, we talked a little NFL. We actually talked a lot more Syracuse than anything. Uh, we talked a little NFL, though, with everything going on with, you know, head injuries and officiating and all that. So look for that tomorrow. It's going to come out first thing. There'll be a video much like this and a little a story on Syracuse.com as well. So a little plug for something I think you guys 
are really going to enjoy. As Andrew says here, I spend every football Sunday watching Scott Hansen. Every once in a while, he will drop a Syracuse reference in there, uh, as does Mike Tirico. Mike Tirico is very good at getting Syracuse references into Sunday night football as well. Sean McDonough, Syracuse alum, calling the Syracuse Clemson game this week. So they're out there, man. That Newhouse Mafia, they are, are certainly out there. But Scott um, had some really cool stories. I think you guys will enjoy that tomorrow. Thanks for indulging a little plug there. Uh, what do you say we wrap it up there for this week's edition of Orange Weekly? Syracuse 44, Clemson 41. That's my prediction. I think we see a high-scoring back-and-forth game. And how about that? Could we be talking about a 7-0 and Syracuse football team Saturday? Come right back here on Saturday afternoon on these same channels that you're watching. Syracuse Orange Football on Facebook, Syracuse Orange Sports on YouTube. Same thing we're doing here. We'll highlight your comments back and forth with you. Your instant reaction with me after Syracuse, I'm going to say it, takes down Clemson on Saturday in Death Valley. It'd be about 3 o'clock or so, about 10, 15 minutes after the game. We shall see how it goes. Jimmy doesn't like my score there. Syracuse had trouble scoring against UVA. No way Cuse puts up 30 against Clemson. We shall see. Come on back and tell me if I'm right or wrong, Jimmy, Saturday after the game right here. In the meantime, you guys enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks for watching Orange Weekly presented by Krause Health. My name is Brent Dax. We'll talk to you next time.